East. This is, um, that's what they're calling the new, the, the campus here now. It used to be the Trinity Technology and Enterprise Campus. Um, and it's the first dedicated space provided by Trinity for civic and community engagement on, you know, in the main city centre. Um, and it's, it's great to have a place for, for us. What does civic engagement mean? For me, it's about you know, getting to know our neighbours and people around us. Um, so you're very welcome. And please come back. We have it part of a four-week program. This is the first. Um, so every Wednesday at four o'clock, and we have a broad range of topics from Maureen O'Hara to Warwick Pierce. So uh, I'm not sure how they ended up together on the same page. Um, just uh, if you don't mind, if you you know, make sure please your, your phones are off and emergency exit at the back and the door you came in. That's actually not an emergency exit there. Despite having a green running man, you can't run out. There's no escape that way. Men's toilets are that way and the ladies' toilets are that way. Um, so just thanks to a couple of people, Betty Ash who brings everybody together in a great way and Lorraine Malone as well. Definitely wouldn't have happen without them. And thanks to Dylan, our, our video guy from Rings End and Archtown Community Centre and their support with this too. <laughs> and finally, what, what, what you're waiting for and why you're here, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Professor Brendan Kelly for taking the time to come along to us today and to introduce him this evening. There. So he is Professor of Psychiatry at Trinity College and consultant psychiatrist at Tala Hospital. And he tells me he's most interested in the extent to which people with mental illness part participate in civic and social life and the barriers they and their families face, both economically and socially. But this evening, he's talking about happiness and what works and, and why and how we can maybe get a bit more happy and who doesn't want that. <laughs> so thank you very much, Brendan. And over Great. Great. Uh Look, thanks for coming along this afternoon. Brendan Kelly is my name and I'm a psychiatrist. So I'm a medical doctor who went on to specialize in psychiatry, which is the, like the treatment of mental illness and similar. So I work in Tala Hospital in the mental health service there and I'm professor of psychiatry in Trinity. So I teach medical students and uh, various others about psychiatry. What I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit more general. Okay, so it's not necessarily going to be about mental illnesses and things like this. It's about mental health and happiness and uh, optimizing mental well-being, stuff like that. Um, a lot of it, um, it will be about happiness. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of research about happiness and then a bit about COVID-19, what it did and didn't do to us. Um, and a little bit about the happy countries in the world you know, and finally, just straightforward bullet points about how to be happy, okay? Uh, just, I'm just gonna give a list of things to do and they will make you happy. Straight, straight, straightforward. Um, none of this find your own path kind of business. <laughs> this is just what you gotta do. So firstly, look, happiness. It's kind of a ridiculous thing to talk about, a ridiculous thing that there is research about as well, because it's so different between people. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a little, bo a little look at it in a minute. But this is a book I did a few years ago called The Science of Happiness. Um, and I made a faithful promise not to spend the entire time promoting my own book. <laughs> so there won't be another single mention of my book, The Science of Happiness, okay? <laughs> I will not mention The Science of Happiness one more time. Um, okay, so look, there's a lot of research about happiness, but the problem is how do we measure it? Um, and all the research that I'm gonna talk about, and I'll only be talking for maybe 25 minutes because I'll be very keen on some questions. All the research I'm gonna talk about measured happiness by asking people, how happy are you right now from zero to 10? Zero is very unhappy, 10 is very happy. How happy are you from zero to 10? So will anyone tell me how happy are you from zero to 10? Does anyone have a number for me? Eight, eight, nine, five, ten, ten. Okay, okay. So you're you're pretty happy, folks. Uh, those of you who are answering. Um, okay. Here, here's another question then. 
who do you think are happier, men or women? Oh, okay, we're getting a lot of women answers. Usually a room answers all the men say women and all the women say men. Um, men, okay, you're going for men. Okay, so your average answer was maybe nine out of 10, eight out of 10, and there's an overwhelming view women would rate themselves as happier than men would rate themselves. All right, well firstly the, the gender thing is very interesting. It used to be the case that women rated themselves a lot happier than men did. But that has changed in the past 20 years dramatically. And now men and women rate themselves as equally happy. So, so you're just as likely to give me a seven as you are likely to give me a seven out of 10. So a big shift, and it's seen in nearly every country in the world. Women's happiness has come down a little bit. Men's happiness has gone up a little bit. Does that make any sense to anyone? Uh, any of the yas, can, can any uh, uh, shout me out a reason? I think it's a lot more proper. Men make more divorce, oh no, and children. Okay. Okay. So look, you said a lot more pressure on women now, and they're working. That's what you said. And with regard to men, you said men give a lot more to the home, and you seem to be suggesting that makes men happier. Is that, have I got that right? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I think the biggest point is your point, which is that the more women seem to participate in the workforce, the happier men become, you know? So the, the chief beneficiaries of, in happiness terms, of women in the workforce is not women being happier, but men. And, 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 and why is that? Can you, why, why isn't more going out to work more making women uh, happy? Actually, this is really topical given the referendum. Yeah. Now I think about it. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. To go out and have to make a choice and stay in a home with their children and, and a career. So it's yeah. very hard. They still have to be ruled out. Yeah. Well. Okay. So for those of you who can, uh, maybe well, can't on hear. On the other hand, there's, there's women quite happy to go out to work, get a break from the kids. Yeah. And so it, there's a balance. That, yeah. So look, the, like the issue of choice came up women having a choice to go out to work or not, and, and really not having that choice, right. basically. Yeah. The, your, point was probably the biggest one, which is the double jobbing. Yeah. That, that, that there isn't a diminution in the, in, the, in the expectation at home. There's work outside the home and in the home. Yeah, yeah. And then your point was about the... Some women like going out to work yeah. so, so, and don't have a choice yeah. and they have yeah. to, but others, others don't. Socialize around yeah, so what, what, are, what are all of those things I think are the reasons, but just the bottom line here is now men, we rate ourselves as equally as happy as women do, and that is a big shift. Um, mainly because happiness in women has declined and men, happiness in men has gone up a bit. We're not as happy as you might think being at home with the children, although we don't say that out loud. Is that okay? Um, and what about this one? This is a really interesting one about how happy do people rate themselves at different ages. Who's going to tell me that younger people rate themselves as happier or older people say that they're happier? Older, happier. Anyone going for the opposite? No. Okay. So we're having a sort of a group a group effect here, and um, so what? Well, this has been studied in well over two hundred countries, and what's really interesting is the same pattern that happiness is kind of like a U shape. That children tend to start happy; they get steadily more unhappy, particularly in the twenties and thirties. And the lowest point, usually, on average, is around, well, it's exactly the age of 49 and a bit, which I was about six months ago. <laughs> so the lowest point, I hit it when I was 49 and a bit uh, six months ago. And then it starts to pick up again. And if you remain in good health into later life, the chances are you will be as happy as you were as a child and indeed happier. So. And so it's really, really interesting. So those of, you know, often I'm talking to groups of students and it's a difficult message because they're entering the valley of darkness for 10 or 20 more years. 
but um, lots of good news, perhaps, for many people in this room, with all respect, which is that things are going to continue on and upward. Uh, the key thing is remaining f as physically healthy as is possible, you know? So it's a U shape, and that is evident in every single country where it's been studied, which is really, and why, why does such happiness come in later life? Anyone gonna shout me out a reason there? Yeah, you've got your hand up with the, the red. Yeah, you haven't got that much left, and you haven't got that, no, this is what she said, I'm not telling her she hasn't got that much left, just because I know it's hard for some people in the audience to hear other people in the audience. So you haven't got that much left, and you might as well enjoy what's there. Yeah, lovely, lovely, and just behind you before we come to you, yeah. And that's yeah. Hard work is gold. So at the age of 49 and a bit, right, you're, you know, there, there's a job maybe, or there isn't, which is even more stressful. There's a mortgage, or there isn't, which is even more stressful. There are children coming or going or whatever they do. So there's, there's a whole lot of stuff there going on in the 40s, okay? And obviously, you know, children are a very great joy. I'm saying that because this is being recorded. Um, but, but, but yes, you're absolutely right. A number of those things have resolved themselves one way or other. So it, it's different. It is very different. And maybe our last on this point. Well, that was really a variation on that, a reduced version of responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not the hard work or the obligations you have, it's the degree of responsibility that you have. Yeah, so a reduced uh, responsibility, the degree of responsibility that is felt. So exemplified in the difference between your own children and your grandchildren, where there's this enormous, almost infinite responsibility one feels my wife feels, rather, for our children. And then there is, uh, you know, the, the grandchildren, the different relationship there. Uh, obviously, you know, such an important relationship, but just not quite the same in terms of responsibility. Yeah, so there's those things. There's also the just not caring about stuff so much anymore, which seems to be one of the big ones, not caring so much what other people think or, or whatever. A lot of that never mattered, and it obviously, you know, one starts to see that. Um, as, uh, as, as things go on. Um, like it never really matters what other people think as much as we do. Because I know this because I went to a, a yoga class, right, uh, a few years ago. And I went to one. And it was full. You were going to say that I only went to one. Oh, yeah. And, and I went in and it was full of like young women who were really into their yoga. And they were just all very fit and standing up on one finger and stuff like this. And oh my God, I could barely make, I got home and I said to my wife, I, I made a holy show on myself. I said, I'm never going to that again. I stuck out like a sore thumb. I'm a balding middle-aged man who can't do yoga. I'm never going again. Everyone was just staring at me. And she said, oh, she said, nobody was looking at you. <laughs> you know, we overestimate how much, you know, how, how much, people lo look at us, because she said, if it was a room full of these really fit, beautiful people, she said, I can guarantee you, no one looked at you for a minute. <laughs> but that's not how we feel. But ultimately, we come to let go of this, this self-consciousness a good deal. Uh, so that's to do with age, a U-shape, which, um, which is reassuring. Um, and just remaining aware of that is good. It's in every, every country where it's been studied. Extraordinary. What about, what about genes? Do we inherit our happiness? What, like, do we inherit happiness from, from our parents? Um, or is it utterly unrelated? Is there, a, is there a biology? You know the way everything is genetic and, and they keep talking about genes and inheriting stuff. There's a... Yeah, not, so, maybe a, so maybe not genes, but attitudes. And of course, attitudes and temperament. Their temperament is something that is very genetic, interestingly. Uh, but is also picked up because, you know, we, we see our parents, we see our, our guardians look, looking after us. And you said half and half. Is that what you said? Yeah. Which is remarkably accurate because they estimate about 50% of the variation in happiness is inherited. It, you know, and we seem to inherit a, 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 what we'll call a set point, which is a point of happiness around which we fluctuate but we never go very far from it. So I might have this kind of moderately happy set point in my, that I was born with. And if I win the lottery, 
I'll get happier for a while, but pretty quick, pretty quick I'll be back in my usual zone. And the flip side is, if I have a tragedy in my life, I will go down, but remarkably quickly, I'll be back up in my general zone. So we seem to inherit a sort of a set point, uh, which is really, really interesting. Um, and it makes sense, because I bet we all know people who are generally happy, no matter what comes along, and people who are generally sad all the time, no matter what comes along. So, so we do, there is a genetic component. This is a picture of twins to try and illustrate uh, the genetic uh, component. So we do have some control in our decisions and choices, but there is, a, there is some bit of biology going on here as well, um, interestingly. Upbringing, and look, I'm gonna be very brief about happiness and upbringing. Obviously your happiness through life, it does depend to a significant degree on your childhood. But there's only one really big message, which is conflict in childhood is bad for happiness as a child and right through adult life. That is the single most reliable finding from the research on this. Conflict in childhood is bad. So, you know, if I see two people and they're fighting and giving out and throwing cups across the kitchen at each other and drinking and leaving and coming back, and they decide to stay together for the sake of their children, I can be very clear with them, which is that is a lovely thought, but the conflict must stop. If you cannot stop the conflict, you're harming the child. Is that okay? And that factor matters more than almost anything. It matters more than the, the, the constitution of the family, whether it's two people or one of these throuples we keep hearing about now, as if throuples, as if this was a major issue in our society. It's the daftest. Uh, Anyway, it, it, none of that matters even faintly as much as the absence of conflict. Is that okay? That is the biggest responsibility we have as parents, is to keep the conflict as low as possible. All right. Um, okay, so uh, avoiding conflict is key. What, what about children, though, actually? Do children make you happy? Uh, okay. We got some nods, we got some sometimes, and we didn't get any no's, because that's not something we can really say, is it? It's not an acceptable thing for us to say, and I have put on the record already that children are a very great joy, but um, how happy does a child make you? Uh, and does, it make you, does the child make you happy forever? Um, there's really nice research now to show that this is different for men and women, and that Having a child br brings a happiness boost to women for two years, and then it's gone. But you still have the child, okay? <laughs> so this is a problem. <laughs> for men, there's a happiness boost, but it's not as early. It starts in women just before the birth. But in men, it's a bit later, it's not as large, and it's not as long-lasting. But um, for women, it's very clear. Uh, the first two children, a happiness boost for around two years, uh, each child and then it's gone. If you have a third child, there might or might not be a happiness boost. And if you're on the fourth, I don't know what you're doing because uh, someone needs to sit down and have a chat. Because the, on, average, on average, there tends not to be um, uh, such a boost after, your, uh, after you go beyond three, uh, to be honest. Um, and marriage. I don't know if there are any married uh, couples or indeed throuples in the audience. Uh, if that's even possible. Uh, does marriage make you happy? Oh, hand is up for this one, I'm hoping. A few of you want to know what's a throuple. Okay, uh, a throuple is a relationship involving three people in a, in a long-term durable, re <laughs> durable relationship kind of a situation. And in the recent uh, the discussions about the referendum, this has bizarrely emerged as an issue, as if Ireland is full of throuples. Um, uh, who, who, uh, you've left your third one at home. Well, okay, but okay, so getting back to the point, the doubles or throuples or whatever, um, does marriage make you happy? No, no, yes. I'm not going to identify the people who said no in case 
sometimes, <laughs> yes. Oh, we're getting a yes. Thank God for that. Uh, we're getting a yes. Exactly. He's a man. Are you <laughs> suggesting that happiness makes men happy, but maybe it's more complicated? Marriage, Marriage makes men happy, but maybe a little more complex for women, yeah? I think men get more out of it. You think men get more out of it? Yeah. That's for sure. Oh. <laughs> Okay, we've, we've, we've gone into complex gender <laughs> politics, which I don't feel qualified to navigate, and I do want to get out of here alive. I'm just, I know that's an emergency exit. I'm going to need it in a minute. Marriage, uh, on average, does make people happy. The question is, how happy? And there's some really nice studies about this. How do you measure how happy marriage makes you? So they did this. Um, you shouldn't have sat in the front. They, they did this wonderful research where they said, look, uh, oh, we go for you, actually. Um, imagine you're happily married, because you seem to say marriage makes you happy. And we're go we, the researchers, we're going to take your marriage partner away for a year, and then we're going to give them back to you, all right? And how much cash do you need for that year to make up for the happiness? In my case, quite a lot. It, <laughs> I'd have to hire, hire a housekeeper uh, and various other people. But it's, so, so okay. It's Oh my, oh my God, 80,000, 80,000, 80,000. So to take away your happy marriage partner for a year and restore them to you, for that year you would accept 80,000 euros as compensation. We would start at that point. We'd start at that point. Any more bids on this? More or less? Not less? There are married persons in the room who are not answering the question. <laughs> Usually someone, someone, someone says priceless. Oh. That's where I was going to go. There is no amount of money. And if I ask this question for long enough, someone invariably says, will you, will say, can I give you money to take him away? Um, you know, for a year or more. There is an answer. The average answer is $100,000. And that's how much we value one year of happy marriage. So yeah, it put it in around, yeah, in and around what you said there. Um, now it's a daft question, obviously. Uh, it's a completely daft question. But the, the bottom line is that long-term relationships, that's what I mean by marriage, by the way, long, durable relationships um, do tend to make us happy. And they tend to make men and women more or less equally happy, OK? Um, uh, yeah, so, so that's it about family life and happiness. Work, I, I better move on. So work does make us happy as well. Uh, being, uh, what, um, what that means is being engaged in an activity, be it education, be it paid work for certain parts of our lives, be it being retired and doing other things. Engagement and work does make us happy. Uh, income doesn't make us infinitely happy. We get happier as our income approaches around 80 or 90,000 a year. Beyond that, there's very little additional happiness to be gained from income. And again, when you adjust for purchasing power around the world, that number is the exact same when you adjust for what you can buy in different economies. Um, and it makes sense. Because if you earn 100 million in the year, and next year you earn 101 million, that's not going to make much difference. But if you earn zero, and you suddenly earn a million, that changes your life. So you know, there's diminishing returns. And around 80 or 90,000 a year is the point at which, um, OK. The other thing about happiness and mental well-being is physical health. And for this, I put up this image, because I have a bit of a thing about uh, <laughs> yoga being uh, exemplified as the, uh, you know, the ultimate. Um, but I need to face some pretty hard facts about my own life, which is I am never going to look like that <laughs> for several reasons, or even anything, or be able to do that. And nor do I particularly want to. And this, it kind of distresses me sometimes, the images of activity and health that were given. Now, that's an image of a woman, obviously. But the images, particularly of men, that we see associated with gyms and physical fitness and that we're presenting to our children and young adults as the ideal, they are not healthy images. You know, the, the, those, those muscle-bound guys in the gym. And I don't say this just because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of them. Um, uh, no, I would be much more in favor of an image of activity like this one, which is people doing something in a socialized way, in a relational way, and a realistic, sustainable way, rather than 
these terrible images we see outside gyms all over the place, which are off-putting for people who might go to gyms, you know, um, to be honest, and also unrealistic and unhealthy, above all else, unhealthy. Um, and I've spoken to lots of gym chains about this, but they, they, just, they just don't listen. Very, very simple health advice um, is uh, that we all need to get more sleep and that we need to do 150 minutes of activity is a better word than exercise. All you have to do is activity to the point where you're sweating, you're perspiring a bit. So that can be walking briskly is plenty. Um, if you're doing more than 150 minutes of exercise per week, I don't know why you're doing it because the benefits are not necessarily demonstrated. Now, some people have particular reasons. They want to you know, run a race or whatever it might be, and that's all fine. But in terms of health, uh, health benefits, we're looking at 150 uh, minutes a week. And the final point here on the happiness research is to do with uh, values and believing things. So does religion make you happy? We're getting a lot of yeses. We're getting some noes. The evidence is pretty clear about religion, it's, it's, and it's interesting. Religion does make people happy. That's a general rule, all right? It doesn't apply to everyone, a general rule. And when you, but when you dig into it, is it going to church and meeting people and chatting and going to the community center and knowing people and all that, or is it believing, belief? You know, believing in God or whatever it might be. And the research is strongly in favor of the belief that it is believing that matters, that that is where religion holds its power to improve well-being overall. And most of us think instinctually it's to do with community connection. But belief matters. The other point on values is politics. Um, and there's really nice work on this, um, very consistent. Who's happier, do we think? Left-wing people or right-wing people? We're going for right-wing or in the middle. Evidence is all one way on this, I'm afraid. Right-wing people are happier. The more right-wing, intolerant, bigoted, prejudiced you are, the happier you will be. And why is this? Because left-wing people, they're unhappy. They want to change the world. They want to improve society, solve the problems. They spend their time working on big problems that they will struggle to solve, which is very important. It's good for us. It's not necessarily good for them, interestingly. Um, so, but however, if you are right-wing and you think everything's fine and everything should stay as it is and we don't need to worry about the problems and so forth, you personally will be happier. The world will be a much worse place because of you. So the ideal is to be a right-wing person surrounded by left-wing people who are working to make your world a better place and you're just cruising along. That's what the research shows. And I used to show a picture of a smiling Donald Trump and an unhappy Hillary Clinton to demonstrate this point, but um, we won't do that. Donald so, Trump won't be unhappy. No, no, you see, uh, yeah, you, you, do, you do wonder um, about the appeal. It, 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 I know it's also to do with certainty, knowing stuff, not having doubt. Doubt is a problem for left-wing people. They're full of, full of doubt, I'm told. Okay. <laughs> Right, so look, there's some overall well-being stuff. Um, and I want to talk a tiny bit about COVID-19 now, because COVID was really, really interesting in terms of um, happiness and well-being and things like this. And I, whenever I talk about this, I know there are going to be people in the audience who've had COVID and had really bad experiences, people who have been bereaved, they've lost a family member because of COVID or had some kind of adverse experience of isolation or things like this. So I am aware of that. I'm just going to talk, though, about general population type things, um, which are not always what we might have thought. Here we are in February 2021. So we're a year into COVID, which kind of started for us at the start of 2020. So we're kind of in the thick of it here. Now, I couldn't tell you if we were at level five, level four, level three, or whatever, but we were somewhere there in uh, February 2021. And asked, do you feel lonely? 17% of women did and 9% of men. 
Does anyone have a thought about that number? 17% of women felt lonely. Missed the interaction. What would, if I did a survey today, we're after COVID, what percentage of women would say they feel lonely? The exact same. And the same for men. Men, that bit lower than women, always. But the percentages of people feeling lonely did not change in COVID. Really interesting. The other, uh, I want to show you another number here about mental health. Do you think your mental health was affected uh, by COVID? And now we, we kept hearing during COVID about older adults being isolated and the relentless messages about people with underlying conditions, uh, you know, needing to be particularly careful, the mental health of older adults with that particular risk and so forth. But you look at this number here. This is for young people. 75% of them said their mental health was very negatively affected. Um, and older adults, it was, I'm gonna say only 32%, but like that's not an only number. It, it's a lot of older adults, okay? But I want to show you the comparison. Turns out older adults were a lot tougher than they were given credit for. They had been through more things. And as one man said to me at one of these talks, he said he lived through TB. He said that went on for 20 years, or 30 years, it would, would have been more accurate. And in COVID was maybe three years, two years. So that's a lot of people with their mental health negatively affected across all age groups, just to be clear. But the distribution was not what we were told most of the time, uh, interestingly. Um, and I'm gonna have some more numbers here because uh, I think I have some, uh, some interesting, um, yeah. So here are some happiness numbers for Ireland. Um, and this is, uh, how happy are you, zero to 10? And you can see here in 2003, a survey in Ireland, it was about eight, which is exactly what you guys said. You were all around, you were around eight, isn't that what you said? So there you are. And you can see Ireland's, you know, it's pretty stable for a long time. So then there were some sort of economic problems, if you like. Um, and it dipped down to 6.8 during the, um, do you remember the IMF and all that? Does anyone remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so that, that was a bit of a hit, all right, and the recession and so forth. So we began to say we were less happy. But look, it picked up fairly quick. And then it got to 7.7 .7 and out of 10, okay, where zero is very unhappy, 10 is very happy. You with me, yeah? And here we are in COVID then, 2021. What, what number did it go to then? Did, you know, what happened, do we think? Okay, you, so we expect a drop. Yeah. Stayed the same or maybe went slightly up. Le le level, level. Yeah, yeah, really, really. Um, oh, that's COVID, by the way. Yeah, that's COVID arriving. I've got my sequencing uh, not great there. Oh, look, I have a box. And we have level, pretty much. And that's how we rated ourselves. This was a survey where people came and said, how happy are you? You just tell me, you know, zero to 10. So really, really interesting about COVID. Why didn't it dip more? Any thoughts about that, anyone? I think a lot of kindness came out during yeah. COVID. A lot of kindness came out during COVID. Yeah, more so, so social kind of. Yeah. So people you wouldn't have otherwise spoken to. Yeah, at the back there. So may, maybe more time to reflect and less of this rushing around that we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess all, all of those things to some extent were likely playing in it, but just, I, I really like the numbers, to be honest, you'll have picked this up now. I really like the numbers because they often go against what, you know, what some, some of the things we might think. Um, and I think, and I've, I've just done a book about COVID and its impact on us uh, uh, in Ireland, and I do think it showed us, my, what my usual line is that, that our, our society, our, our economy and all of that is more fragile than we thought. It could all be suddenly pretty much suspended amazingly, you know, travel and schools and so many businesses, but that we ourselves are that bit stronger than we might have thought that bit kinder than we might have given ourselves credit for before this, and a little bit more resilient than we might have given ourselves credit for. 
Because if you had told me five years before COVID, right, that there would be a pandemic, that they'd close the schools and travel and so many businesses, and that we wouldn't be allowed to go like two kilometers, was it two kilometers? You know, I would have said, that's crazy. No one will cope. I definitely won't cope. Nobody will cope. That's ridiculous. Can't happen. And yet, now we, there were losses and difficulties. I know that. I'm not downplaying that. But it turns out we can cope with that kind of thing much better than we thought. And it was the same for everybody. Okay, and it was the same for everybody. Okay, so you're saying there it was a sort of an equal opportunities virus. Yes, so you weren't looking at somebody else having a better deal than you. Okay, so, so the restrictions applied to everybody equally. And the only time that they didn't, now that you mentioned this, was when people over the age of something or other got particular advice to stay at home, and that difference caused such controversy. So your point is so interesting. It wasn't the advice. That the equality of it was the thing that mattered. And the moment they wobbled from that a little bit, all hell broke loose, and, and they were wrong to wobble from it. You know, I mean, the statistics would suggest older adults were an awful lot stronger. So really interesting. So then that commonality, the we're all in it together kind of carry on. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, okay, so then um, the happiness, uh, uh, where is happy? The happiest country in the world. Here's the World Happiness Report. Where is the happiest country? Denmark. Finland, Denmark, Japan. Scandinavian, Japan. Japan. What, not Japan? Japan, not Japan. Okay, so uh, not Japan. Japan is obviously one, in terms of the world, Japan is towards the, t you know, towards the top. Rich countries do better in these surveys, quite simply. But the number one is indeed Finland. And the top three always include the Scandinavian countries, be it Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and so on. Uh, number one is Finland. And the unhappiest in the world? America. It's not, but we'll come back to you. <laughs> Afghanistan. Pretty impressive. And why Afghanistan? Why is Afghanistan at the bottom? Well, it's a great country that is very happy. It's social, economic, and based on how they see society. And it's not about money. It's about how they see as a nation. That's very yeah. much sort of the thing. Afghanistan is just broken. Afghanistan is broken. Listen, people keep invading Afghanistan every, every so often. If it's not one side, it's the other. And the country doesn't have enough time to rebuild itself or get its society or its political things in order sufficiently to support basic income, basic needs aren't being met, so you're gonna have. So look, uh, Finland, they rate themselves you know, 7.9, maybe eight out of 10. That's when you ask someone in Finland. Ask someone in Afghanistan, how happy are you, zero to 10? The average answer is 2.5. It's two, it's two. That's a huge difference. Like this methodology, is, it's, it's not great. You know, like, cause I could, my seven could mean something different to your seven. I could be a five now. You know, you, you might have been a 10 when you came in and now I'm pointing at you, you've gone down. There. <laughs> I've gone up, I've gone up. You've gone up, okay. But even with those problems, with measuring happiness in this way, the average answer being eight and the average answer being two, that's a huge difference. That's a total difference in the way you see yourself. And where does Ireland come in the scale from um, one down to 137? Number 14. Number 14, so we're very near the top, to be honest. And COVID didn't change the rankings. It didn't change the scores particularly. Of course, the most important thing about Ireland's ranking is that, um, <laughs> yeah, how about that? <laughs> oh, you're surprised they're that high. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so look, um, what I wanted to talk about today was some of this general sort of uh, well-being um, general well-being uh, stuff um, and I'm just going to finish with a couple of things about being happy look I've mentioned some of it already obviously physical health is essential and that's doing as best as possible with not so much exercise but physical activity we cannot let these images of exercise put us off physical activity is what matters it doesn't need to be dramatic it really doesn't the other big piece of advice that I didn't mention really is, okay, does anyone know about mindfulness? Yes. Okay, so we're getting yeses, a 
and the hands going up and things like this. Yeah, mindfulness has really become the thing. Like you can't move now, but there's people with mindfulness quizzes, mindfulness apps, and mindfulness uh, this, that, and the other. And mindfulness is very good. I mean, it is a bit oversold, if I'm honest, but it is a very useful technique. But for some people, it just doesn't click. It just doesn't feel like something they can do or will do. And a lot of the benefits of this kind of thing can come <coughs> in another way. So um, the idea of mindfulness can you know, sort of bring this kind of image to mind, uh, this uh, uh, Buddhist monk meditating. Or indeed, nowadays, we have a lot of schools doing mindfulness exercises <laughs> with children. Uh, I mean, that's a fairly unrealistic example. <laughs> but the, the, the essence of it is focusing on the present moment and trying not to worry so much about the past, because that will just make you depressed, basically. And not to worry so much about the future, because that will just make you anxious. So no, 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 no good lies either way. So it's kind of trying to focus a little bit on the present moment somewhat more than we currently do. You know, it's not always going to be possible. You know, but you know, just a little more present moment focus and ways of practicing that. And it's not quite the same as mindfulness, but the idea of absorption is one that being absorbed in something taps into some of that. It's, it's some of the distance. And now, as promised, we are coming to you. Um, a lot of us become absorbed in different ways. So some people, for example, go running. And I have a friend who goes running. And I say to him, what are you thinking about running? And he says, nothing, nothing. There is nothing there. There is just my feet moving. And I'm saying, OK, that's your feet, but what's in your head? Are you thinking through problems from work? Are you thinking about things? And he said, there's nothing. It's empty. And my, I have a colleague, and she goes swimming most days. <laughs> and I say, what are you thinking about when you're swimming? And she, said, <laughs> and she said a very interesting thing. She said, when I'm swimming, there is only the swimming, which is really, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to go all Buddhist on you here, but Buddhism teaches about something called non-self, when you stop thinking about yourself as, as a self. And when she says there is only swimming, she meant there's only the movement. There's no, she's not thinking about herself, her life, her world. It's absorbing, and the water is so good for that. It kind of gets everything out of your mind. So water is really good. But the other activity that a lot of people do, and I have a non-traditional image of it here, I have deliberately gone for a non-traditional image of knitting. Um, because there's some Olympic uh, person knits. Do, do, uh, who was that? A well-known English swimmer. Well, he's not well, enough, well, well known enough that I can know his name. Uh, I don't know. So no, it became a little well known during the last Olympics. There was an athlete who was yeah. swimming, uh, uh, swimming, but then also knitting between times visibly. And this is an absorption activity as well. You can just get absorbed in it. And I remember talking to a person about knitting, about mindfulness. And she said, no, 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 forget mindfulness. She said, knitting. She said, because when you knit, all thoughts can just go from your head. There's just the activity. You have a period of absorption, and it's better than mindfulness, because at the end, you have a lovely jumper or a scarf <laughs> or a scarf or something. So, go, go, give me that again. Knitting up the unraveled sleeve of care. I love that. I really like that. Shakespeare got there before. Shakespeare, <laughs> that was Shakespeare. I say credit where it's due. Um, so, so, okay, so I just have this up here to emphasize the importance of identifying the activity. Now, it could be gardening, it could be playing music or listening to music, it could be knitting, it could indeed be meditating or something as well, or swimming, just something that gets you into the moment, absorbed in the moment. You know when you're doing something for an hour and you look at the clock and it has actually been two hours? Yeah, that's the thing. More of that. Is that okay? I don't know what it is for you, but more of that. So look, what does the research, where does the research um, get us uh, in terms of what I said at the start? Uh, it's good if you have happy genes. Now it's a little, you know, it's a little bit late for that now because we've all been born. It's very helpful if you have had a happy childhood. Um, 
And those of you who are um, you know, still involved with children or responsible in relation to children, uh, the advice very much is about conflict. Is that okay? Conflict is the biggest single problem uh, in, in most childhood homes. Be old or be young, but don't be in the middle, okay? Those of you who are 49 and a bit, it gets better from this point onwards. I've just turned 50 and it's really picked up for me. Uh, things are much, much uh, better. So it's good if you have a baby every two years forever. Just, uh, you're going to end up with an awful lot of children in the end, but um, there is that two year uh, boost in happiness. Engagement and employment helps. Earning more than 90,000 helps. Watching physical help and having values of some description, be they relig religious right wing, ideally, religious values, and also being uh, socialized helps um, as well. And of course, if all that doesn't work, like if that doesn't work for you or us, we can all just um, move to Finland <laughs> would be the answer. Although if we all went to Finland, I don't know what would happen then. Now I'm gonna finish with this slide, which I'll leave up here. It's a lovely quote from someone. It says, happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, and this is the becoming absorbed, this is the knitting, it's maybe the meditating, it's the swimming, the running, the walking, the gardening, listening to the music, playing the music, playing with the grandchildren, whatever it is that just gets you absorbed. Uh, if you turn your attention to other things, happiness will come and sit softly on your shoulder. I saw you taking a picture of that, but uh, you could take another picture now. <laughs> with... <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say, and I do hope we have some time for questions more. What about social media? You know when you see people on social media, um, and it's, look at it for a few minutes, next one is two hours gone. Yeah. Is that the same effect, or would it be a negative effect? No, social media is a really interesting one, and you know, it's the question I get asked the most, so I should, probably should put it in the, in the talk itself which is social media is quite problematic because one of the causes of unhappiness is comparing ourselves to other people, which we always do. So like if I'm looking at social media, right, flicking through things, my brain is comparing myself to what I see. So the chances are that I, Brendan Kelly, a balding middle-aged man who has arrived home from work wet and tired, I'm comparing myself to, I don't know, Kim Kardashian if you know who she is. Does anyone know who she is? Okay, so my brain will make that comparison. A photograph of her with, you know, that's been prepared by her stylist and her colorist and her other things. And my brain will make the comparison. And about one minute later, no, one second later, my brain will tell me that is a ridiculous comparison. You know, that is just daft. You are not Kim Kardashian. I am not Kim Kardashian. <laughs> you could have said that to me more gently. Could you? <laughs> But my brain will tell me that was a ridiculous comparison, but the emotional damage is done. I have done the comparison in that split second. So the problem with social media is it allows us to compare ourselves to other people quicker, more times than ever before at an industrial speed. You know what I mean? And even though we do it so fast, we might dismiss the comparisons immediately, but we have done the comparison and I have fallen short compared to Kim Kardashian on so many days. Would you stop saying you're afraid I do fall short? Would you not tell me that I'm perfect as I am? If it makes you happy. Okay. Um, so, okay, so that is problematic. That is not the kind of absorption. It's a kind of a healthy absorption we're looking for. And sometimes people say to me, look, what if I just go drinking or taking drugs or something? That makes the time pass fairly quickly. So we're looking for a healthy activity that, that produces absorption. Social media is interesting. It does have real positives. It, it does allow people to connect in important ways that would never have been possible before. So you've got people with uh, particular interests or people with, I don't know, kinds of disabilities and people who think they're in a community of one. But in fact, they can now realize they're not. There's more people out there with whatever they've got going on. And that's really important. Um, but we do need to limit the time we spend on it and we need to limit our phones quite dramatically. So we're talking about mobile phones downstairs at night time. They sleep in the kitchen. That's where mobile phones sleep. If you have a problem with that, they sleep in the boot of the car. And it's so interesting because audiences always are, say, oh yeah, I leave my phone downstairs uh, and I sleep upstairs. 
And I say, okay, if you can do that, why not leave it in the boot of your car overnight? And they say, oh no, I couldn't do that. And it's funny because there's no actual difference. It's just in a different, it's just not in the building. But somehow physical distance from foam is, is a thing. Um, so, so yeah, so look, that, that is obviously not a good form of absorption. And we need to, um, I, think, I think there are some generational differences coming out. I think very young people use mobile phones differently. The, the generation who did worst are me. The people who, for whom phones arrived uh, and they were new, we, we couldn't cope with it at all. Like lost the head completely. Um, some younger people have a much crisper idea of the difference between in real life and on the phone. Some of them do. Um, but but, but the, in answer to your point, a really long answer, which is that's a great point, uh, but obviously that's not the kind of absorption that we have in mind, because it does allow this crazy comparing that our brains do. I didn't give a good example, because comparing me to Kim Kardashian is not unreasonable. Okay. <laughs> any, any other thoughts? Um, Yeah, is purpose important to happiness? Yes, it clearly does seem to be important to happiness. And that's some of the thing that that values slide I put up in, because whatever value they've studied, they find it does have some significance, be it religious purpose or belief, or be it the political purpose or belief. Um, this, does, this, this, this does have an impact. The other thing that's slightly more complex, and I think I mentioned to some of you earlier, is about children making you happy. When I said children give a happiness bump for about two years, there's really interesting research about, you know, who is, who is happiest? So let's say people who have no children, people who have children who grow up and say leave home in their early 20s or some kind of do something and go off and get a job or people who have children who never actually leave home, they're there all the time. What, what, what do you think was best in that scenario on average? No? The middle one. Yeah it's, really, yeah, it's really, really interesting that there does come a time when they should get out, okay? And in a society that doesn't facilitate that, that is having complex effects on well-being. Children leaving home is, is, is a very big thing, and there are feelings of loss and difficulty and all of that. I just, you know, that's true. But it appears that them staying at home and not being able to leave, maybe despite their very best efforts, is, does change the whole dynamic of well-being. And that's a very hard thing to say without saying directly to your kids, get out. Or what you, I'm not going to repeat what you said because that's been recorded. <laughs> Um, but, but, but that's not an unreasonable thing from everyone's viewpoint. There is a time and a cycle, you know, for these things. And in a society or an economy that doesn't let that happen, it, it, it's compli it, there are complicated effects for sure. Oh, sorry, at, uh, at the back. Hi. No, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really really interesting, and there there isn't a significant difference, or rather, other factors have a bigger impact in those situations. Things like uh, income and 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 so on. Um, but systematically, we cannot say people who have no children are less happy. That that's that's not. That's not the case. Happiness is a very dynamic thing. Probably the most important thing I said today is to do with that genetic set point, which is that these bumps up and down I'm talking about, for each individual, they happen around that person's happiness point. So like it, it's not like suddenly having children would move you from a two out of 10 to a seven and you from a five out of 10 to a seven. It would keep you around your set points. It would bump you up or down. They're very relative. So, so, so it's the genetic thing that is the biggest. So in answer to your question, no, there isn't a systematic difference there. And some of the changes I'm talking about are quite small, really, in, in happiness. Um, but there isn't a um, systematic difference between you know, not having children. 
Now, these are average things because there are different kinds of not having children, right? There is, having, there is wanting to have children and going through many years of trying to have children and cycles of IVF and really difficult experiences that obviously affect happiness. And then there are people who just don't want to have children or would want children if their life kind of worked out that way and if their life doesn't work out that way, that's fine too. Do you know, so there are very different pathways to not having children, if you know what I mean. And I've huge, huge, one of my deepest sympathies is for people who want to have children and despite great efforts and staggering sums of money, don't. Sorry. One of those cases, and I have kids, and I have more of those kids, you know, I have a good job and so on, and I'm extremely happy, as I said. Uh, and I think away from people, I think we're more happier. So, but then the, the thing is, you know, scientists now, the new stats that I'm seeing, I think society is now are having less children. Yeah. Okay, so then, so I don't know if you have seen any kind of uh, metrics happening based on people now not having children to start in developing that one. Oh, oh yeah, that's... So that's another example of what you probably were mentioning. And, and I think yeah. the stress that I took away from arriving to this point. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So just at the start there you said what, what that you, you, don't have, you, don't, you don't have children, you have a good job and, and a mortgage. No, no mortgage. So and no mortgage. Okay, so can I, and can I, can I, like, yeah, sure. are you single? Can I ask you out? <laughs> 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 no, I, what I'm trying to say is that I have a choice. I have chosen not to have kids. Okay, I've yeah. chosen to have yeah. a good career. Yeah. I've chosen not to get a lot. And so the pressures I took out of things brought certain stability for myself. Yeah. That I can then choose to do other things that I would like to do, and I'm doing it. You know, you know, I mean, I mean, activities almost full time, and it's one of the less ones, right? But I'm also on the right track. Oh dear, dear, dear. Yeah. Oh dear, dear, dear. This is not going to turn out well. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, the society is moving in a way that they're having less children, so you will have more people like me somehow having a choice. So what would you say is that happiness would be in that case? Oh yeah, well, that's really interesting. So the individual happiness there, you know, is to do with having what, what I'm going to call, what I'm, look, what I'm going to call uh, the good fortune to have a choice or that life worked out in such a way to give you these choices, which is undoubtedly due to your own choices and hard work for sure, but also, you know, not being born in Afghanistan was very helpful for this. Do you, 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 you know what I mean? So you were born in Venezuela. You were born in Venezuela. Well, there, <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, no. Oh, okay. So if there are more people who are more empowered to make choices like you're making, obviously that is, that is good. There is a problem with increasingly uh, atomized or individual choice making in this way. We do tend to do better when we're more connected into village type structures, however they come about. They mightn't be actual villages. So a lot of studies have proven that the ideal social group size is between 100 and 150 people. So that the, so organizations at that level, say companies or that generate a sense of community, tend to have a little bump in productivity and how, how well uh, everyone gets on in the company. Once they get bigger, it gets more complex. The same with uh, uh, villages and uh, residences of about 100, 150. There's a sort of a magic that happens there. It's not necessarily sustainable because they get bigger. Everyone making entirely individual atomized choices is a little problematic in terms of community, for sure. Because the stability that children bring, also known as the ties, the boredom, the responsibilities, <coughs> the dropping them to football, forgetting to collect them from hockey, <laughs> leaving them standing outside the drama class for four hours in the rain, which happened to a friend of mine. Um, these things matter in communities as well. And not everyone will use their individual, individual choice possibilities in a responsible way like you are clearly doing. So it is a bit systematically problematic when we have a, a whole world full of, a world full of soloists and nobody in the choir. That always gets an ah when I can work it in. Yeah. Does thinking come into it? Like you could think to yourself, or you could think to your happiness. Mm. <coughs> you could get up in the morning, flash around, and say, "Yeah, that's going to be a great day." Or you can turn around and say, "That's the last thing I think I'll say in the WhatsApp now, aren't they?" <laughs> Does your thinking really come into it? How do you think? Yeah. So your thinking habits come into it an awful lot. So we think uh, many, many things very, very quickly. 
And that is the entire basis of what's known as cognitive therapy in, in depression or similar. So that um, you wake up and it's lashing rain and you think um, it's raining, I can't go out, uh, my life is a mess, this is terrible. And then about 30 seconds later you say, oh that's ridiculous, it's actually just raining and I can watch Netflix. What's happened there is you've put yourself through a little cycle of negative thinking and it's a pure habit. And that if you do that 100 times a day, our studies would say that you do it 1,000 times a day. We, we do this so fast, and we might correct ourselves, but no more than the comparing on social media. If you go through that little cycle 1,000 times a day and correct yourself every time, that still has an emotional impact. So it's really interesting that you notice this and to just say, ah, look, I'm having that big exaggerated reaction to something small. And should we do it all the time? All the time. On the Lewis coming here. Do you know the Lewis stopped for a minute before the red cow? It wasn't even a minute. It's probably 20 seconds. It wasn't at the red cow. I said, why is it stopping? There's no Lewis ahead of me. It could have gone to the stop. Why, you know, uh, and all this in about 10 seconds. And I said, oh, for God's sake. And the Lewis moved. And so, so yes. Our habits, our simple thinking habits, even though I can now describe it and it's clearly ridiculous, I did it. And do you know what I'm going to do on the Lewis home? The exact same thing again. <laughs> like, honest to God. I know we've gone over time. One more? One more. Oh, I, I am fine on time. I don't care. Can I, can I come in there? I'm going to make it worse that initially uh, I also had, uh, what did I have? Principles and? and I, I also had eight pillars, <laughs> which the publisher made me take out. He said, that's too many strategies, pillars, and things going on right there. Uh, go on. Well, that's really, really, that's really, really interesting, yeah. So addiction is, um, it's a state where there's something and it's characterized by uh, craving, uh, prioritizing the substance over other substances. Uh, it's character, oh, hang on, uh, craving, um, prioritization, inability to stop once started, and what's called rapid reinstatement, so that you need the, the thing, the drug, the alcohol, or whatever, to keep going. So absorption is to do with voluntarily uh, being absorbed in a particular activity, but capable of stopping and not necessarily craving it next time. But it's a difficult one because I'm very absorbed uh, when I go to the movies. I just, the whole world disappears from me. And I went to three movies in one day in the Irish Film Institute and my wife said that was now addiction. <laughs> she, had a, she had a problem. I said it's for my mental health. And I felt that gave me the moral superiority. But that's a really good point. That's a really, really interesting one, which I will think about further. Next time, it will be addressed. Hi. Is there a definition of happiness? Is there a definition of happiness? That's, that's really, really interesting. And so the research, as I said, folk, you know, the researchers, and I do a bit of this research myself, try to make a definition of happiness and completely fail. So the, the way the research works is it skips the whole definition stage and just says, how happy are you? Um, and you see, if you say seven out of 10, that could be completely different to your seven out of 10 and different to yours. But if we are trying to increase happiness, it's your rating of it we're trying to increase. There's no point me measuring your happiness and then telling you you're happier than you used to be. So we skip the definition stage completely because it's more or less impossible. And we just go for how happy are you now? And then we, we do something like make you exercise, I don't know what, and then say how happy are you? Because your rating of your happiness is the only one.
that matters. Ah, oh, when everyone woke up to see the snow. Yeah, that was, that's one of these things about, about happiness, isn't it? So a bunch of people woke up and said, oh, that's amazing. And a bunch of people like me walk up and said, oh no, there's gonna be traffic, they're gonna close the schools, we're gonna have to pick up the this, that, and the other. And I think what that does is that amplifies uh, where you're at. So it's the people in their mid 40s for whom that was a complete disaster because they'd so much going around the place to do in the day. And it was, it was I had a terrible day actually, now that you ask. <laughs> the car got stuck in kind of slush in church town, I had to reverse onto the other side of the road. There were people beeping me. I was lucky to get home. So I had a really, really tough day. Uh, and, you, and you had a lovely day just looking out at the snow. So look, um, I think that is probably the end, but a lovely day looking out at the snow is a lovely way to end.